all together, let's say, Jesus is in us and with us. Say it again. Jesus is in us and with us. Say it again. Whisper it. Jesus is in us and with us. Again, Jesus is in us and with us. Say it again, but now silently. Again. Now be totally still and silent. So that's such a simple prayer, isn't it? And that little bit of silence we had at the end, you might want to extend that for a few minutes and then maybe five minutes and then maybe ten minutes. Uh, this is Christian meditation. It would be wonderful to do that. I often pray that way just for up to half an hour, just uh, being still in the presence of the Lord, hand on the heart with Father Cardinal Van Juan's prayer, Jesus is in me and with me. Another beautiful story about prayer and the simplicity of prayer comes from the same Cardinal. <coughs> he talked about uh, a man called Jim, a very simple man. Jim went into his, his parish church he just goes in and comes out within about 10 seconds. And he, he did this several times during the day as he passed the church. He never passed the church without going in. But he was only there for less than 10 seconds and came out. So the parish priest, when he noticed this over a few weeks, was becoming to be suspicious of Jim. And he, when Jim came out of the church one day, he said, Come over here, you. come over here. What are you doing in my church? I'm praying. You can't be praying. You just go in and out. I'm just suspicious of you. Are you thinking of stealing something from the... No. All right, then well, tell me how you pray. Well, I'm a very simple man, Father. Uh, I just um, farm and I uh, have no education. So my prayer is very simple. I just go into the church and I say in the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, Jesus, hear Jim. And then I go out and I do that as often as I can as I pass the church. So that's your prayer, is it? Jesus, hear Jim. Oh. Yes, that's my prayer. So you're not going to steal anything from them? No, 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 opposite, opposite. So the parish priest was still a bit suspicious, but he thought, oh, well, maybe. So this is Jim's prayer. And Jim, Jim was uh, known in the, in the town as the village as a very, very happy man, full of joy, a big smile on his face. And, uh, but then one time he got sick and uh, he had to go to the hospital. He got very sick. He went into the hospital and uh, he, he spent his time when he could uh, getting out of the bed and going around and saying hello to everybody in the hospital ward. Um, but for most of the time he was in, people came up to him and and said, uh, Jim, you seem so happy, but uh, we never see anybody come to visit you. Other people come to visit the other patients, but nobody comes to visit you. He said, oh, no, I, I, I get a special visit several times every day. And I said, oh, but we're here all the day. We've never seen anybody come to visit you. Oh, no, no, I get, uh, that's why I leave that chair there, because he comes and sits there. And they were thinking, oh, Jim, he's... The mind's going a bit because we never see anybody come to visit Jim. And he's now saying that the person comes several times a day and sits there in the chair. And, uh, well, who is this person? Oh, it's Jesus. He comes to visit me. Jesus comes to visit you. And they were thinking, hmm, okay, Jim, what, what does Jesus say to you when he comes to visit you? Oh, nothing very special. He just says... Hi, Jim, Jesus. Now, everybody, I have done 13 years of full-time theological studies, and I can tell you right here, that's the best definition of prayer I've ever heard, and it's the simplest one I've ever heard. So rather than use the word Jim, you could use your own name. For instance, my name is Christopher. So sometimes when I'm finding it difficult to pray, I say to Jesus, Jesus, hear Christopher. Can you say your own name? Just whisper it. Just say your own name and say, hear, and, hear Jesus and put your name down at the end. So off you go. Again. There, see, you're getting into the habit of it. And then listen carefully and Jesus saying back to you, 
Hi, Christopher. Jesus. Hello, Christopher. Jesus. Good morning, Christopher. Jesus. Allow Jesus to say that to you now. And again. There you are, everybody. I've taught you two prayers from a man who's on the way to becoming a saint, and they're the simplest prayers you could possibly give. I give them to you as a little gift, and I want you to, as evangelizers, as missionary Christians and missionary Catholics, to go out now when you go home over the next few weeks, and, you, and they say, what did you learn? And you, you just don't say what you learned. You say, I learned to say a little prayer, and I'd like to share it with you. How about that? You'll be able to share it with people at home people even in the workplace. Even if they laugh at you, don't worry, they laugh at Jim. But in a sense, they might laugh at Jim, but in a sense, they feel, maybe Jim's got something I haven't got. Maybe you have got something I yearn for. It's Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Everybody, I'd like to talk a little bit about the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church this morning, sanctifying sacraments, the sacraments that the Church gives us I mean, Jesus is with us at all times, of course, as Jim found out, but there's crucial moments in our life, daily and also in our whole life, where the church comes in a special way to make Jesus present in the church. And remember, I think I mentioned it to you last night, it's important that we have two things in our hand. One is the Bible, and the other one is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I haven't brought it with me because generally when I use it, I use my iPhone. It's easy. It can be downloaded free of charge. You Google St. Google. Is there a St. Google? I don't know, but we inter he intercedes for us every day. <laughs> we Google Catholic, uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church and then you'll get a, you can download it. And all the teachings of the Catholic Church, particularly on the seven sacraments, you'll find there. We, we find the seeds of, this, of the seven sacraments, especially... Uh, the Mass, we find it very much in the Bible, but then we must remember that we Catholics are not only Bible people, we're certainly that, but we're also people of a living tradition with a big T of 2,000 years of the words of God coming to us, Jesus through the Holy Spirit whispering through us. So the Word of God and the tradition of the Church, the words of God. Scripture and tradition forming like two lungs on the one body. So don't just breathe with one lung. Breathe also with the, the lung too of, a, of the tradition. And to know the tradition is important. Uh, the catechism is a great way of doing that. So let me have a look at the seven sacraments. They're divided often in different ways. Uh, three different ways actually. The first one's the initiation sacraments of the Catholic Church. The initiation sacraments, there's three of them. I wonder if you can guess what they might be. What would the first one be, the first initiation? Baptism. Second one would probably be the f completion of baptism, which is confirmation. And the third initiation sacrament, the, the, the most important, the mother of all the sacraments, the Eucharist. All the sacraments are found in the Eucharist in one way or another. They are the initiation sacraments of the church, and I'll come back to them in a moment. Then we have the healing sacraments of the church. We have the sacrament of reconciliation or penance or confession. And then we have anointing of the sick. Jesus coming to us in his mercy and, to, and healing to be with us. And then the third set of sacraments, and I mentioned one of them at length last night in my homily, holy orders, and then the sacrament of matrimony. So let's have a look first of all now at the initiation sacraments of the Catholic Church. That's baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. And we put them together because originally they were together. In the early church, what would have happened is that adult baptism would have been the norm. We baptize infants uh, in the Catholic Church. I suppose, I presume in India too, most of, the, of you have been baptized as little babies. And we do that as long as the parents take on the responsibility of bringing the children up in the faith. If there's no faith in the family, then we won't be uh, baptizing babies because the idea there is that the parents, the first initiation, the first uh, educators of the children in faith, uh, educate their children in faith and help them to un unwrap the great gift of baptism as they get older. But in the early church, most of them were baptized as adults, about your age or perhaps a little bit older. 
And before they were baptised, they would have had like a, um, a school of three or four years, and it was pretty full time. It was called the catechumenate. And uh, we have that renewed in the church, particularly since the Vatican II Council 50 years ago. The right of Christian initiation of adults, the catechumenate, has been renewed and restored in the Catholic Church. And that's a great gift to the church. But in the early church, perhaps three or four years of pretty intensive catechesis, of learning about the faith, uh, in incorporating yourself into the Christian community, getting to know them, them getting to know you, you really become part of it. You're just not there for a few days, you're there and they, there's a, a decision made eventually after a number of stages that you're ready for baptism. And what would have happened, you and others, would have gone to, for instance, what we might call today the parish church and the, the, uh, the baptism would have taken place in the foyer of the church generally. As you enter the church, the baptismal font was there. Even today you go into churches sometimes and the baptismal font is in the foyer of the church. That's the area of the church before you come into the body of the church. And that's where the baptism would have taken place by perhaps the parish priest or one of the priests there. In the early church, the baptism wasn't normally done by sprinkling. It was done by full immersion baptism. Now, this was um, like a, a little swimming pool almost, I suppose, in the foyer of the church. And it had steps coming down. You see it still in some of the ancient churches around the world uh, where the adult goes down step by step into the baptismal font uh, and he... He, is, uh, he or she goes under the water and step by step they come out. We, we can see some great evidence of this and the, the meaning behind that from the scriptures and we, not, we often go to St Paul who has a great understanding and, and a theology, I suppose we call it a baptism and he, uh, we can see that particularly on chapter 6 of Romans um, verses 3 to 4, 3 and 4, chapter 6 of Romans, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him, buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Can you see the movement in what St. Paul is saying? In baptism, we are buried with Christ. We go under. There's the baptismal font, the steps going down into the water as it were drowned in Christ. And then we rise into the resurrection. We enter into his death. We rise into his resurrection, coming out of the water, a new creation. Baptism takes away all sins, breaks all curses, removes us from the darkness and poison of evil, and makes us a new creation. No longer aliens, no longer sinners, but citizens of God, citizens of heaven. This is St. Paul. And this is why we, we waited for people to be old enough to understand it and to truly believe it. That the baptism is going down into the depth and then the rising into the resurrection of Jesus. The death and the resurrection of Jesus is the essential proclamation of Christianity. Amen. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus will come again. That's what Christianity says. As I said last night, we are an encounter religion. It's not just an enlightenment religion or a, a way of making you feel clearer in your mind. No, no. We are actually entering into Christ. Him entering into us through grace and faith. And that's symbolized, sacramentalized in baptism. And that's one ancient way of constructing the baptismal font to bring out the theology of it. Going in, coming out, going into the depth, rising into the resurrection of Christ. Wow, isn't that fantastic? 
Now, the thing is, everybody, most of us have received that when we were children, and it may not be until we come to a retreat like this as adults, young adults, that we realize, oh, wow, is that what happened to me? <laughs> and that's why very often at Mass we have the renewal of the baptismal vows. Remember, especially at Easter, the priest will ask you certain questions, and you say, I do, I do. Now, I'd like to do that right now because baptism is like a gift all wrapped up and when you come to a wonderful time of encounter with Jesus like we are now, you say, oh, I'm, I just want to enter more fully into Jesus. Well, you've, it's already happened to you in baptism, but now unwrap the gift even more. And I haven't got much time to do this. So I'm only going to spend a few minutes on this before I move on. But I didn't want to go without giving you, each one of you, an opportunity of renewing your baptism. And now I've explained it to you very briefly from the Bible and our tradition, scripture and tradition, what it means. Entering into the death and resurrection of Christ and rising into the body of Christ the church. Breaking away from all darkness, turning your back to sin and coming back to the Lord. Let's renew. I want to renew my baptism vows too. Let's all do it together. So please respond to these questions with the answer, I do. But just before we do that, silently close your eyes and say to Jesus, in renewing my baptism now, Jesus, I ask you to really reactivate my baptism. Help me to be, as it were, baptized in the Holy Spirit afresh. Surrender to Jesus. Do you reject Satan and all his empty promises and all his evilness? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord and the giver of life? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the power of God amongst us, creating us in the image and likeness of Christ? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting? I do. This is our faith, everybody. This is the faith of the Catholic Church, and we're proud to profess it. Through Christ our Lord, amen. 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 We've renewed our baptism. Hallelujah. 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 Repeat after me this little prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus. Son of the living God, Son of the God. I, renounce all evil in my life. I renounce all evil in my life. I repent of all my sins. I, all my sins. I acknowledge you as my personal Lord and Saviour. Fill me with your Holy Spirit afresh. Make me the person you want me to be. Guide me. Rule me. Rule me. Be loving me. Be loving. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Wow. What a, it's not even breakfast and we're well and truly on the way. <laughs> and there's the baptism. And then the priest would uh, and the assistants would dry you off because you'd be wet, and then they'd put on a white garment on you in the early church, a white uh, gown, I suppose, like I'm wearing a white all over you, and then almost dripping wet, you would walk with the others who have just been baptised with you from the foyer of the church, or the entrance of the church, down the main aisle, and then up here would be the bishop. Me, up here, up here, I'm up there waiting for you. And the bishop would complete... Uh, the last part of the baptism, which is the, uh, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, been coming, been, he's sending you out to be missionaries. He's sending you out to be Catholic evangelizers. He'll put his hands on your head in position of hand, and every one of the seven sacraments, there's this coming down of the Holy Spirit. In the, the technical term is epiclesis, the coming down of the Holy Spirit, mainly to the, the extension of hands. And then he will put his thumb in chrism, holy chrism, and anoint you, put your, his 
make the sign of the cross on your forehead and he'll say, be sealed with the Holy Spirit and you say, amen, and then he'll say, peace be with you and also with you and give you a sign of peace. So let's renew that. Hand up those who have been confirmed. Confirmation, I suppose the majority of you, yes, the vast majority. Good, put your hand down. There might be people who have never been baptised and will say, Bishop, I've never been baptised, but I'd love to, to know more about it. In that case, please see one of the priests. What? And maybe you have said, I've been baptised, but I haven't been confirmed. Again, go back and see your parish priest and say, I, I want to receive the sacrament of confirmation to complete my baptism. So the first thing I'd like to do, would you mind just uh, turning around to a person beside you? That's right. And I'd like you to extend, uh, one, of you, one of you extend your hands on the head of the other one. No, no, just one do it. The other one can do it in a minute. <laughs> that's right. One of you extend your hands over the head. If you've got three, that's right, one hand each. Make sure everybody's attended here. I don't want anybody missing out. All right. Lord Jesus, we ask you to renew all the graces given in confirmation to the person who we are placing our hands over their head. Once again, fill them with your Holy Spirit and make them, Lord, evangelizers and missionaries. We make this prayer through Christ the Lord. Amen. Could you swap now and the other one put the hand on the head of the other one? Lord Jesus, fill this person with all the fruits and the gifts of the Holy Spirit afresh. Make them the people you want them to be, temples of the Holy Spirit. Give them all the love, the fruits of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the peace, the wonder and awe, the courage, especially young people, the courage to be your people. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, can you just put a sign of the cross on each other's forehead? That's it. There we are. Now give them a little sign of peace. That's right. There we are. We've just renewed our confirmation. How about that? Whoa, amen. <laughs> Woo. See, uh, everything that happens here, everything that happens is at the very centre of Catholicism. You don't sort of go up there for the Catholic Church and come here for something else. No, what's happening here is very central Catholic. And what we've just done there is we've... We've renewed the grace of the sacrament of confirmation for you and I to become missionaries, missionary disciples with joy. Pope Francis wrote a whole beautiful document on the joy of the gospel. And he's saying that the great need of today, as the other popes have been saying over the last couple of decades, is to renew the face of the earth with the presence of Jesus, to, to accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior as if for the first time, and to really... Not, not to have the Catholic faith as just sort of a museum piece that I dust down every now and again, but something real and active, Jesus, real and active in my life, which I want to share. Amen. 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 Alleluia. Now the third sacrament of initiation, the confirmation, and the, confirma the, the Eucharist, and the Eucharist would take place immediately after the confirmation. The early church, you would receive these three sacraments at the same, same moment, at the same uh, gathering. And it still happens today, of course, in large parts of the world. But as I say, sometimes the, uh, 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 it's, there's other reasons, there's historical reasons for that, and I won't go in for that now. But the Eucharist then starts, the Mass that we celebrated last night. Now, if we go to the Scriptures, we find the, the Eucharist everywhere in the New Testament and particularly like the Last Supper. The Last Supper was the first Mass. The first Eucharist was, was the Mass of the Last Supper. And in, Jesus said at the mass, Last Supper, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, this is my body. He then took the cup filled with wine and he said to his disciples, this is my blood poured out for you. Take and eat, take and drink. Jesus the priest, and Jesus says, in, uh, do this in memory of me. He gave it as like his last gift to everybody. And we, particularly we Catholics, have been doing it ever since. Every time we go to Mass, we, we, 
represent, not represent, represent, present afresh the Last Supper. It's not the bishop or the priest who is the celebrant, it's Jesus, the high priest, Jesus, and the priest and the bishop, and with the deacons, they're just standing, they're just standing in for Jesus. He is the one leading the Mass. He is the one doing exactly the same what he did at the Last Supper. And the, and the, the priest is the, uh, the alter ego, the, uh, the other Christ, of, uh, and he's just being available to, for the high priest Jesus to use him. And then, then the priest says, uh, you know, this is my body, this is my blood. He's using the words of Jesus. He's saying it's not the priest's body, it's not the priest's blood, it's the blood of Jesus. It's wonderful, the great gift of the Mass. And yet so many absent themselves from Mass on Sunday particularly. It's our great priority, the gathering of God's people. Jesus waiting for us every time the Mass is celebrated. Many of you are going to Mass now every day if you can, to receive his body, to receive his blood. And in the, the, hear the living word of God, shared and broken in the homily. Wow, fantastic. The mass, Jesus with us in his body and his blood. And uh, I really want you to think seriously about what I've just said. This is linking us dramatically with Jesus, directly with Jesus at the Last Supper. And then not only at the Last Supper, then the mass was celebrated again in another form when Jesus died on the cross. I could speak about this a lot longer another time, but even at the, the death of Jesus, when the soldier put the spear into his side to make sure he was dead, what does the scripture say in John's gospel? It says, came out blood and water. These are, symbol, these, these are signs of baptism and Eucharist. The water of baptism, the blood of the Eucharist. See, these are little symbols coming out throughout peppered throughout the scriptures about the Eucharist and then everybody we have in Luke's gospel at the end of Luke's gospel Luke uh, 24 verses 13 to 35 Luke chapter 24 verses 13 to 35 we have the two men on the road to Emmaus I'm not going to read it out you remember don't you it's, it's a it's got four parts to it these two men who we've never heard of before, they're, they're really disappointed with the death of Jesus. They were expecting Jesus to become some sort of big, big military uh, warrior. And there he is butchered on the Calvary cross. They're scandalized by this. And they say, well, that's it. We're disillusioned. Off we go. And they go off to a place called Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. And we, then we hear what happens. Jesus, without them recognizing it, he walks beside them and says, what are you talking about? He says, oh, don't go there. We're really upset about it. We've, we've been very, our hope had been, dot, dot, dot. Our hope had been. These are losers. These are people that have given up on the church, given up on Jesus. A few years later, we got caught up with making money and all the problems at home and and Jesus didn't seem to be helping us. I stopped praying and all the rest of it. And we had hoped that Jesus would help us, but he's let us down. Who's let, uh, we've let Jesus down. Jesus hasn't let us down. And that's the sort of talk that they were saying. So they were dragging each other down, doing the very opposite of what we're doing here, building each other up. They were dragging each other down. And down, down, down they went until Jesus said, you foolish men. So slow to believe the good news. And they said, what are you talking about? And he said, don't you? And then he explained the scriptures to them, a little bit like what I'm doing now. Here's Jesus explaining this. This had to happen. Don't you know the scriptures? That the one who was to come would suffer and die, but then he would rise again. And they said, oh, we haven't, uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe we've been thinking it's all about me, it's all about me, rather than it's all about you, it's all about you. So they said, listen, come on, um, we've got some fish curry and rice over here, there's a nice uh, restaurant here, we'll pay. <laughs> so there they were, in the eating house, and... Jesus, they didn't know it was Jesus just yet, but he took the bread, oh, 
here it is. I'll just read this part out because this is the essential I issue here. Here it is. When he was at the table with them, here it is, everybody. He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. Why did he vanish from their sight? Because he was now present in their heart. He didn't have to be near there physically anymore because he was present in his spirit within them. It's the same with us now. Jesus is not present with us physically like you and I with each other. He's present with us in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. That's the presence of Jesus today in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the love relationship between God and the Father. No greater power is there, power 2015. The power there is the power of the love between the Father and the Son given to us what we now call the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Took, blessed, broke, gave. That's mess. That happens at the Eucharist. Took. We take the gifts of bread and wine. There's a procession that comes down. Taking the gifts of bread and wine. Take, bless the Eucharistic prayer. The priest puts his hands over the gifts. There's the epiclesis, the coming down of the Spirit again. Every sacrament, the coming down of the Spirit through the hands. Blesses the Eucharistic prayer, preface. Broke the Lamb of God. Lamb of God. The priest breaks the bread. Yeah, you can see it. One bread, many pieces. Give, and then forth gives Holy Communion. What happened at, at the Last Supper, what happened at the road to Emmaus, happens every time you go to Mass. We're part of an ancient tradition that started with Jesus and continues in Jesus. We haven't just been given the Mass that floated down a couple of years ago. It's been there when Jesus was there. He gave it to us. He's a great gift to us. Therefore, we honour the Mass. Jesus is waiting for us at the Mass. Where are you? He's waiting for you. He's giving you his body. He's giving you his blood. You can't say, oh, I'm too busy. I'm going to play soccer today. I'm going shopping today. I haven't got time for Mass. What? You're keeping Jesus waiting. He's waiting with love and mercy. There's the Eucharist. And in a sense, all the seven sacraments find their home in the Eucharist. It's the mother of the sacraments. So they're the initiation sacraments. Remember, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Focus on what I've just said. And then at the end of the men on the road to Emmaus, what did they do? They stood up and they ran back to where they were running away from. They went back to Jerusalem, back to the Calvary Cross. So the priest says at the end, the Mass has ended, go in the peace of Christ to love and serve. Off you go. Missionary sent at the Mass. Just don't, don't, don't go, just leave the church. No, go and be Eucharist to the world. Be the body and blood of Jesus in the world. You have received the body and blood. Now be the body and blood of Christ in the world. There's our mission, everybody. That's what evangelization is about. Being the arms, and the legs, the eyes, the mouth, the ears of Jesus to the world. So they're the initiation sacraments. Now let's have a look at the healing sacraments, all sanctifying us, making us holy in God. I'd like to talk about a sacrament that's often called the uh, forgotten sacrament. It's the confession. How do you call it in, in India? Do you say confession or penance? Confession, yeah. Um, this is sometimes forgotten around the world because people sort of, uh, they say, oh, I'll just forgive myself. But no, no, Jesus has given us this moment where you go to the priest and, and you have contrition, you are sorry, and you confess your sins, the times you've turned your back on God. You think seriously about the sense of sin in you, not because it's, it's only a means to an end so you can experience the sense of forgiveness, 
And then you, you courageously say without holding anything back, the sins that you know that you've committed. Your God has given you a conscience. And others can help you to work out what to say. The priest might give you a, a quick moment of encouragement, perhaps a bit of advice, and then he'll put his hand out again to you. Here it is again, the epiclesis. Put his hands towards you and give you the absolution prayer of the church. And at the end he'll say, you are forgiven and set free. Go in the peace of Christ. I must say, I've been a priest now for a long time, and the times I feel Jesus has used me most has been in the confessional. Just making myself available to people to come, to speak out their heart, to surrender their life to Jesus and articulate areas where they put a block between Jesus and, and themselves. And then for me to be able to say this wonderful prayer of forgiveness. There's no greater power than being forgiven by Jesus. And I, you can almost see it physically in people. Their backs go up. Their head goes up. There's a dignity, a human dignity restored. And a smile comes on their face, being forgiven by the Lord Jesus. They've got a fresh start. Off they go. Please, everybody, never think your sin's so great that God can't forgive you. Never hold anything back from confessing it. I remember some years ago, I was at a big conference like this, but it was in another part of the world, and uh, the speakers were gathering together, and one of the speakers who was a, a cardinal from America, he was, he was about uh, 10 hours late. We all gathered in the night. He came in the morning at breakfast time. And there was a plane delay. And he said for about five hours, he was in this little um, room uh, waiting for the plane to get ready, ready for the plane to be ready to be boarded. It was running late and then they had to clean it. And then they had some engine problem and they had to fix it. So there were about several hundred people in the in the uh, gateway or whatever it's called there before you go onto the plane. And they were all crowded in there. They weren't really able to go out. And just near him was a father and a son. And the father bought the son a little puzzle thing that you put together uh, and uh, to keep him occupied. Well, the, the cardinal said, for about four hours, the boy said, You've got, and then he said, oh, I've, I've messed it up. Can I start again, Daddy. Yes, you can start again, son. So he goes for another minute. Or, oh, I've messed it up, Daddy. Can I start again? Yes, you can start again, son. I've messed up. This went on for four hours, and the, the cardinal was saying, stop it. It was about, he wanted to say that, but then he said, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said to himself, this is like us with Jesus. We're, with our life, we've messed it up. Can I start again, Jesus? Jesus said, yes, you can start again. How many times can I ask forgiveness? 70 times 7. In other words, forever. I am there forever to forgive you. And the cardinal came in, although late and didn't sleep at all, he was radiant. He said, I've really learned something about God in a deeper way through what that father and son said in front of me for four hours as we're all sitting together. Isn't that wonderful? He could have been angry and annoyed about everything, about the plane delay and about being old up there and about this repetition going on, but he could see Jesus in the midst of all that. Wow, amen! amen. Jesus speaking to us, using us as, as different ways of coming to people. About uh, Christmas, yes, that's right. Before Christmas last year, um, I went to prison. <laughs> Before Christmas and Easter, I always like to go to the local prison to visit the people that live there. And there I am in Canberra, Australia, and they've got a very big prison there. And I went to the prison with the chaplain, and um, I, I wanted to celebrate Mass, but uh, they didn't permit me for certain security reasons. And uh, I, I, I wanted to see... As, as many as people as I could, and they said, well, you can't, that area is locked down today. So, Archbishop, uh, you've got to go to solitary confinement. I don't often go to the, 
the, the, the most secure area where the, the hardest of all the criminals are because uh, the, the, uh, the chaplain would go there, but I've only got a certain amount of time and it takes about 40 minutes to go through all the clearances to get into the um, super, super security part of the prison. But because I couldn't do the other, I said, okay, well, let's go to the super, the super security. So we had to put the fingers in and get them the fingerprints. Then I had to go in front of a machine to get my eyes photographed. I had to be searched to make sure I had nothing on me that I shouldn't have had. I, they didn't put me into the machine. I had to go out like this to make sure there were no drugs on me. <laughs> then I went through one, two, three, four different lockups lockups, lockups, until we went right into the most secure area where the murderers are, where, where the ones that have done the most heinous things are imprisoned there. They're locked away. And once we got right into there, they said, just wait here, Archbishop. And then they got, they unlocked a prison door and then they got the prisoner, three great big uh, um, wardens, the, the security people there, took him to this other room and put him in there and then they said, you can go into that room now. So I went in there to see this person I'd never met before. And it, he was, there was a, quite a big room, but he was locked up in a special cage at the end of that room. And I, was, I had to speak to him through this cage. Uh, I, I asked him, can't, can't you unlock it so that I can talk to him face to face? No, 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 no. That's the only way that people from the outside including me, could talk to him. A hardened criminal. And so there this man is. I knew he was a Catholic because I could see it on the, uh, the form. I had no idea what sort of Catholic he was. And so there I am on my own with him. And um, you don't ask questions like, what are you in for? <laughs> you don't ask the rather personal questions. You just presume he's had something very, very bad that he's done for him to be in such a terrible situation. It was quite inhumane the way I, I've never really spoken to a person like that in a cage before, but it was either that or don't see him at all. So I, I introduced myself to him and he said, he had tattoos all over him and all this sort of thing. And he said, you're what? I said, uh, I'm the Archbishop coming to, uh, the Catholic Archbishop of Canberra coming to visit you before Christmas. Oh, he said, you're not, you're not an archbishop. You're, you're the priest or something, are you? I said, yeah, well, I am a priest, but I'm also the archbishop. What do you mean you're the archbishop? So I explained, and this big guy, you know, what do you, what do you mean you say you're an archbishop? And I, and I, so in the end, I had to get out my ID because he just couldn't believe I was an archbishop. So I, had, I showed him my ID, which is with me dressed up like this. I was in a black suit at the time when I was speaking to him. And he, once he could realise that I was the Archbishop, he softened. So this great big guy who was, at the start, he was saying some terribly naughty words that you don't normally say in front of bishops, swear words. But once he realised I was the real thing, he, he became like a kitten. So the big tiger became a little kitten. And you know what happened to him once he realised? He said, I can't believe that an archbishop would come and see somebody like me. I can't believe it. I'm so, he said, I'm sorry I didn't believe you, but I just can't believe that an archbishop would take the time, and I know it takes a lot of time to get into here, and to come and see a, a, a fool like me. A fool like me. And I said, I've... You have made my day on saying that. I said, at the moment, I couldn't think of anybody I want to be alongside but you. And I really meant it. And he said, I'm a terrible Catholic. And I said, well, I've got a great God who's full of mercy. And he wants to come to you. So I was there for quite some time. And to cut a long story short, in the end, I heard his confession. And I don't think he'd been to confession since he was a little boy. And you know what happened when I put my hands towards him? Unfortunately, because I was in a cage, I couldn't do it with the way. But I, there was a little opening about this big. I put my hand in it. And I said, can I put my hand on your head? So I, I went like that and put my I could only have one hand in. And I, I said, 
I said the following prayer. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you have reconciled the world to yourself. Through the ministry of his holy church, may Almighty God have mercy on you and forgive you. And as your bishop in this sacrament, I now forgive you and absolve you from all the sins of your life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there was a deep silence. So I just thought, well, there's a godly silence here. I'll keep quiet. So we were very quiet for about a minute. He was closed his eyes, had his head down. And I really felt the presence of Jesus. And you know what happened then? He started crying. He started crying like a baby. Tears rolling down. His, he, all his shoulders. He was heaving when he was crying. This great big man, big muscles. They've got nothing else to do but doing weights. Great big man with big tattoos of all his girlfriends all over the place there. And then he becomes, he receives forgiveness. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that forgave someone like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 We are forgiven by the God of forgiveness who breaks through the stone and gives us tender hearts, the heart of the sacred heart. Let Jesus now, this beautiful image of Jesus behind me, Jesus got his arms out towards you. And I'm going to put my arms. I'm sure the cameraman will get this nicely. I want to have my hands out like this and Jesus' hands behind me. I'm only sort of the instrument of God's peace. But Lord Jesus, I pray for anybody in, the, in this gathering this morning who hasn't been to confession for many, many years. Or even somebody who's been to confession many times but never really said what was really the sins in their life. I ask you to give them courage, Lord Jesus, to give them an opportunity in the weeks ahead to go to confession. And just like that prisoner in the jail, to be forgiven with the kindness of God, the loving kindness of the heart of our God, who visits us like the dawn from on high. He will give light to those in darkness, to those who dwell in the shadow of death, and guide us into the way of peace. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd love to talk to you more about the sacrament of anointing of the sick, but I suppose many of you have not received that sacrament because this sacrament is for those who are seriously ill. Some of you might have. But it's, again, a moment, the sacrament is a moment where you are most weak, where Jesus comes to you. See, isn't that wonderful? The sacraments are where we're most weak or we're most in need of God. The church, in her wisdom, comes with the sacrament. When I'm sick, the church is there with the sacrament. When I'm needing forgiveness, the church is there with the sacraments and the coming down of the Spirit. For my nourishment, the church is there with the Eucharist. For my entry, incorporation of the body of Christ, the church is there with baptism and confirmation. And then with holy matrimony, many of you will receive the sacrament. Some of you already received it. The church is there to bless your union so it becomes like the Holy Trinity. The two becoming one in Jesus Christ in a permanent bond that's open to the possibility of children. Wow. Everybody, there's the seven sacraments sanctifying us, sending out us on mission the initiation sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, the healing sacraments, reconciliation sacrament of, conf uh, of confession, the healing sacrament, anointing of the sick, the vocation sacraments, vocation sacraments, matrimony and holy orders. Jesus never ever distancing himself from us, but coming to us at all times, but particularly at these crucial moments. So I'd like you to think now, 
what I've just said, how will it affect you in the days ahead? I hope it affects you when you renew your baptismal vows. I hope you, def- I hope you want to see that the church gathering around you, the church helping you, the church being one in you, you're not on your own, we're together. So let's just praise God and thank him for the many gifts he's given us, especially the sacramental gifts. We thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've given us. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for the moments of encounter in the sacraments. We ask your forgiveness for the times we've taken these moments for granted. But now with renewed awareness, come back to you with all our hearts when we receive your sacraments, some of which are repeatable, some of which are irrepeat, uh, and are only once off, unique. We thank you that the church has given birth to these sacraments over the centuries. We thank you, Lord, that they remind us that you're always with us. Let's pray together the prayer Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Let's invoke Mary, the mother of Jesus, to lead us closer to Jesus in the sacraments. Hail Mary. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Let us invoke the Trinity, that is the very essence of all the sacraments, the life of the Trinity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, let us show. And finally now, just before we finish, hand on the heart again, and let's say our special prayer. Jesus is in us and with us. Again. Again. A little bit louder. Again. Silently. Again. Be still and silent. Please pray for me sometimes. God bless you. The Lord be with you. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Stand up. The Lord be with you and near you. Amen. Amen. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he fill you with healing peace. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Alleluia. 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 I love you with the love of Jesus.